Hello and welcome to the Wizen World Cup Daily Podcast. Before today, I think you could have been forgiven for skipping this game. Both teams are already basically out of semi-final contention and now Sri Lanka definitely are. The smog meant we weren't sure if we would get a game at all. But this is the thing about cricket. It's just when you're not looking that something ridiculous happens. And that's exactly what we got with Angelo Matthews, the first batter in the 150 plus year history of international cricket to be given timed out. Here with me to discuss today's game is Estelle Vasudevan. Estelle, there was also a very good game of cricket that was played today, but let's start with a timed out dismissal because that's all anyone wants to talk about. Uh, if anyone didn't happen to see it, um, Angelo Matthews came out to bat when Sadira Samarawik Rama got out. Uh, he was all ready to face up and then his chin strap on his helmet breaks. He then asks for a replacement, at which point Shakib Al Hassan has a polite inquiry with Maria Erasmus who confirms the two-minute time limit is up and Matthews has to walk off, throwing his helmet over the boundary as he crosses the rope. Estelle, what was your immediate reaction to that moment? From a Sri Lankan point of view, right? I think immediately my reaction was to blame Matthews um, in the sense that, you know, the tournament has been so shambolic for Sri Lanka and just the approach has been so kind of almost, or it has seemed quite lazy. So. Just seeing that, um, I was thinking maybe he could have just faced that first delivery, right? And no one would have had a problem with him switching up helmets um, after that. Or he could have faced, it was Shaki bowling, so he could have faced up without a helmet. But I think just, you know, as, as time went on and you kind of let yourself think about it, I would personally think that Matthews is quite unlucky because... As you said, it hasn't happened before in international cricket. And all the other cases of when it's happened is, I think, when they haven't actually even turned up to the crease. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, like you said, he, he got to his crease, he took his guard, and I think he tried to tighten his helmet and the strap just came off. He immediately called for a helmet, which, which is probably what any batter would have done in that circumstance. Maybe he could have kind of run it past the umpire just to keep him in the know, like, you know, this happened, I need to get a helmet. Is that is that okay? But I mean, in hindsight, that's easy to think about, right? But in that moment, I don't, seeing as it hasn't happened before, I don't think he expected it to happen. But at the same time, Shakib Al Hassan is well within his right to appeal there, right? Because it's within the laws. And he, he said as much at the post-match uh, presentation as well, as long as it's within the rules, you have to do whatever you can to to win, right? So it's a strange one for me. I think it's within the law, but maybe the law needs to be amended uh, to, to kind of capture this kind of incident because it doesn't have any provision for if your equipment don't fail, right? right? I mean, if it had been his, I mean, if, if it had been something else, like an arm guard or something, it's different. But um, the helmet is obviously far more critical to player safety, right? So, um, yeah, it, it's a tricky one. I think Shaki Balhasan was, he's within his rights to appeal. I think the umpires maybe could have could have done something different. But yeah, ultimately the problem is perhaps in the law itself. Yeah, because I guess also the umpires are also hamstrung to an extent because the law as it's written doesn't have any sort of provision for that. And you're right, I don't think it would be too hard to put in there something like unless the batter has a legitimate reason for not being ready or something because the, it's tricky because there's a lot of things going on he is definitely unlucky to an extent because you know it's a freak thing that happens that your helmet breaks when you're just tight, tightening a trim strap equally that's not in a way that's not Bangladesh's problem so and uh, Adrian Holdstock who's the TV umpire did a quite interesting interview at the uh, at the innings break so he he's two things that he said one was that uh, Matthews actually, the two minute time limit had actually just elapsed, like basically at the point when the helmet does break. So he's already sort of pushing that limit anyway. And also he was asked about, does he think the law should be changed? And he basically said, I don't think so. It's, it's not too much to ask for a batter to have their equipment ready and to be ready. And that is also a fair enough point, I guess, that you could be testing these things before you, before you come out. But yeah, I wouldn't be averse to a change of the law but but as I said the umpires are stuck in this situation because they did ask Shakib a couple of times do you want to withdraw an appeal and once Shakib appeals and by the letter of the law it's out 
the umpires again they don't have any power there to say uh he's not out because we don't think the law should be this way that's the way that that the law is i guess um so yeah i mean yeah it's, it is a weird one where i don't i don't know if anyone's done too much wrong i mean it's it's cheeky from shakib and uh I can see why people are talking about the spirit of cricket, but I can also see the argument that if something's in the laws, you just do it. I can see the argument that the laws should be should be amended, especially you know there's so much focus on on player safety and particularly around head injuries and stuff. That would a player want to face up for even one ball without a helmet? Maybe not. Um, so yeah, it's, it's in a way it's almost amazing that it's never happened before. Especially I was reading about some of the times when it could have happened. So there was one a. Uh, do you know what this one? So I think it was Surav Ganguly in a test match in 2007. Mm, yeah. So Sachin Tendulkar was carded to come in at number four, but he'd spent the last few minutes of the of the previous innings off the field. India then lose two really quickly. So Tendulkar can't actually come out yet. And Ganguly is like, oh, wow, I'm the one who's going to have to come in. Is absolutely not ready. He said he was still in his tracksuit. So he takes six minutes to come out. And he could like well be well within his rights to be out, timed out then. And it just it just hasn't happened somehow, I guess. Just you kind of think it never will and then it does and you're like, how has it not happened until now? I don't know. Yeah, it's like, I was just thinking in the context of like the boundary count, right? Last last time, it's it's all down in writing and everyone agrees to it. But until it happens, you don't realize how, I mean, it might be ridiculous in some circumstances. Um, so yeah, it, it's a tricky one. I, I feel like also... Bangladesh are in a situation where they're not winning, right? So you have to take everything that comes your way in that sense. A uh, lot of Sri Lankan fans will not agree with me on that because, you know, you tend to bring uh, morality into it. But um, at the end of the day, if it's within the rules, then they have the right to do that, right? Mm. And that was exactly what Shakib said. He said something like, we're, we're in a war, so that's what we've got to do. Um, and I guess it was also just such a perfect moment just in terms of the characters involved. Like if you could have picked a captain mm -hmm. who would be the first person to enforce this, Shiki would have been quite, <laughs> quite high on the list. Um, and Angelo Matthews, for some reason, just feels like the perfect victim as well in some ways. Like he's got a really good sort of like, what's going on here kind of face. And then Maria Erasmus, such a great umpire, but also enjoy sort of like the cheeky side of things, I think. So you could see him when he was having this discussion with Shiki and he realized Shiki isn't going to, withdraw it and he just sort of this smile starts sort of spreading across his face and even sort of like Chris Silver and, and Alan Donald involved as well Alan Donald sort of having a chat with Andrew Mathis in the tunnel um, and then you obviously had the perfect sort of uh, uh, coda to it when Matthews gets Shakib out finally and then just gives him the, the gentle little tap on the watch as he goes on his way which was a uh, which was nice wasn't it yeah he, he could have had him early I think Charit Asalanka kind of denied us of what would have been like perfect revenge right um because i think sri lanka did get under his skin he got a lot of chat when he came out uh shakib got a lot of chat from the fielders when he came out matthews also you know talking to him he doesn't sledge much but you know this game perfect time to do it and then asalanka put down the catch so um unfortunate but in the end he got shakib and he also got shanta who i think according to what I've seen is the guy who suggested maybe they should uh, go for the timed out appeal. So kind of retribution, but I think Matthews would, would have preferred if Sri Lanka just won and he didn't get any wickets. Yeah, I mean, because that, that, it was a massive moment in terms of uh, in terms of the game, right? I mean, it was, it was a close thing in the end. Matthews, you know, is the kind of player that would have maybe got them... Uh, got them past 300 but I guess it's also so typical Shakib as well to come out and play that brilliantly having done something like that having had such a poor tournament up until now uh like not not even like he's like he's fired up he just knows that it would be like um almost like such a fitting moment for him to play a brilliant innings it's not like he's come up with a point to prove because he's the one who's done the timed out dismissal like you know it'd be uh uh but he just yeah he's, he's just such a such a great cricketer for that kind of needle. Um, and I guess Matthew's also, I mean, he bowled well against England and bowled really well here. And given he hadn't bowled at all international cricket since the start of the pandemic, it's kind of crazy that he bowled that well. And this is probably his last week in ODI cricket and he's finished it off like this. 
Yeah, it's funny, right? Because it seems like the less he bores in preparation, the better he is in match time. Because he, even in 2019, he had, you know, he he took a wicket of Nicholas Puran, which was kind of, you know, changed the context of the game completely. Um, on whether it'll be his last week of ODI cricket, we don't know that because strange things happen with Sri Lanka cricket. And at the moment, there's a bit of chaos back home. So uh, we don't know. I mean... Th- I did see, I think it was Steve Harmison saying that maybe he should have made been made captain instead of Kusar Mendes. So, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that'll do for part one. In part two, we will discuss a bit more of that chaos in Schlagen cricket and also more of the actual cricket in this game. Estelle, while everyone was talking about the timed out dismissal, Asalanka was putting together a a kind of brilliant hundred, wasn't he? And he's been a he's been one of the stars for Sri Lanka in this competition. Yeah, absolutely. He's he's the type of guy who I felt was kind of, uh, you know, got a bit fired up with that dismissal, started trying to go after the bowling a bit after Matthews was given out. And it really worked for him, which is which is a funny thing, because if you look at Kusal Mendes, right, he started the tournament off with such a big impact, um, scoring at like 150. And then he seems to have gone back on what worked for him. Asalank has been conservative in the past games, but today he was a lot more aggressive and it worked for him. And I think it also helped that he came in a lot earlier than he usually does. So he had that time to build an innings. But he's definitely, I mean, for for a long, very long time, he's been earmarked as a future captain for Sri Lanka. So he's really performed well in the last couple of years. Sri Lanka will want a little bit more uh, consistency from him. Uh, but today's knock, I think, was Perhaps the best he's played in ODI cricket. Yeah, since you mentioned Mendes there, because we actually we had a few questions around the issue of captaincy. One aspect of it being who should lead Sri Lanka, I suppose, past this tournament. Does Shanika just slot straight back in when he's back fit? And also people asking, do we just look at captaincy as being the reason for Kusel Mendes' sort of like downturn in form in the World Cup or is something else going on there? I think on Shanika, it's tough to see him returning as captain, he should come in as kind of a middle order batter because he's one of the only or one of the few batters who can clear the boundary in Sri Lanka. So at least for the year preceding the World Cup, uh, maybe you have him in the lineup. But I'm not sure you can you can really really bring him back as a captain because he's really struggled in the ODI format. But I think. If you really look at it, how much ODI cricket are Sri Lanka going to be playing, right? Uh, mm. In the coming year or so, I don't think there's going to be that much. So it might not really be that much of an issue because with the T20 World Cup coming up next year, definitely the focus is going to be on that. Um, Kusal Mendis, I personally think that there's definitely a mental issue there with pressure because he's a guy who's promised so much from a young age he's performed he's played some incredible innings right but there's also times when the pressure's on and he's not really able to cope with it apart from his batting if you look at his captaincy also he started off really well I I felt like his captaincy in the England game in particular was really good where he rotated his bowlers really well uh, kept you know England under pressure Uh, but also in the in the games following that, we've seen where, you know, guys like Mahish Tikshana, he's not really trusted him much. And this is a guy who's done well for you over the last 18 months, right? He hasn't had the best of World Cups, but he's been that, you know, consistent performer with the ball for you. So in crunch situations, that trust can do a lot for Tikshana's confidence. Uh, situations like that, I feel like there's been a bit of a backward step taken by Kusal Mendes. Um, and even with his batting today, I think I thought he was really conservative. It might have been because in the previous couple of games, he, he he's tried to play attacking cricket, which is what you want from him. But unfortunately, he's been dismissed, right? So today he went the opposite direction and ended up like facing 30 deliveries, but not getting too much runs. So it's kind of like, you know, do you value getting like a 20 of 10 deliveries or are you uh, looking at more of a conservative knock from from a guy like Kusal Mendes who we know can score at a good rate. Isn't interesting you mentioned uh, Teek Shana. We will will come on to Bangladesh later on, by the way, but uh, 
but we just we've had a lot of questions about striking cricket and while we're talking about it a lot of them from from Lalu Sharma so thanks thanks for those um I mean Teek Sharna would have been one of the great hopes of the Sri Lanka bowling unit coming into this tournament right uh, and he's taken five wickets an average of of nearly 70 I mean it for, I, I I mean you can look at it and just look and see that he's not bowling well bowling as well as he has but it is puzzling because I, I I expected when him and Hasranga when they both were going to play I would have looked at him as more of the threat against the bigger sides because um it seemed like he had more of that consistency in his bowling and that seems to completely eluded him is, is it just the trust that he's lost or is it that is, is he possibly been found out has it been that he's just uh, out of form or is it that he's not got his partner Hasaranga alongside him? What, what what do you think's happened there for him? I think it's a combination of things. He hasn't bowled as well as you would expect him to. That's that. There's no denying that, right? But I also feel like his role within that setup, when Hasaranga is there, he's not he's not your main wicket taking option, right? Mm -hmm. He's more of the guy who contains and creates opportunities for the guys on the other end, and. In the last couple of years, obviously Sri Lanka has played a lot more T20 cricket than ODI cricket, but he's used the new ball a lot more than we've seen in this World Cup, which is fair because Sri Lanka have good fast bowlers who can who can really make use of the conditions with the with the new ball in the World Cup. So when it comes to kind of in your in the power play when you're bowling and you're not conceding a lot of runs, the likelihood of you picking up a couple of wickets is high, right? Um, so I feel like he's he's been out of form, but also his role has changed and he's found it difficult to cope. You have to also consider the fact that he's 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 not a like a very experienced guy, right? He's mm -hmm. been playing international cricket only for a couple of years, and Sri Lanka haven't been facing top quality opposition for most of that period. So it it is hopefully something that he learns from we i don't know if you noticed but at the game at the end of the game we saw like the camera focused on him and how how kind of distraught he was because he knows that the responsibility is on him to pick up wickets and to you know do the job for his captain and he wasn't able to do it so obviously he knows what he's supposed to do he just hasn't been able to really find what works for him to to transition from that guy who doesn't concede runs to the guy who doesn't concede runs and also picks up wickets. Mm, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that was that was almost tough to watch that right at the end when he was uh yeah face down on the floor having conceded that that final boundary because I guess especially you know Shranka it was weird actually if they had one today you look at you think like actually not not loads needs to go their way for them to finish equal on fourth on points at least because all that would have needed would have been England to beat Pakistan and Sri Lanka themselves beat New Zealand and for Afghanistan to lose those two games all of those things could have happened but now obviously uh they're out they're out of the race um on Bangladesh I guess it's not been a great World Cup for them in general and even the bright spots they have had might have worried them in a way like when it's Marmadullah who's scoring the runs that would be a concern for them so it would be encouraging for them that Najmul Hussain Shanto who he had 28 runs in six innings before today so started the World Cup with a 50 didn't get another double figure score since then, but played really, really nicely for that 90. But then also Tanzim Hassan Zakib, who's played so little, well, cricket of any description, but especially international cricket, he looked sharp, didn't he? I mean, he went for a few, which bowlers of, of that type can, but he he rushed good batters, which is the kind of thing that you, you wonder, Alan Donald gets him under his wing for a few months, what he might turn him into, I guess. Yeah, I think Shanto was a big, positive for Bangladesh because he got runs in the Asia Cup and looked like really one of those solid batters, right? Bangladesh have been kind of struggling to move on from those big three, from Shakib, uh, Mushfiq and uh, Mahamudullah. But in Shanto, they have someone who's been solid for a while. Um, so it was good to see him back in the runs. I felt like, you know, in that situation where he was batting, like I mentioned before, there was a lot of chat from Sri Lanka and there would have been a lot of pressure there as well in that in that partnership. So he's kind of, the way he played kind of steadied things a bit, I felt, because Shakib was obviously attacking uh, the bowlers much more. Um, uh, in terms of Tanzit, I think, like you mentioned, he, he rushed all the batters. I, he bowled the 
bouncer really well. I felt like he was he's kind of that kind of bowler who who you don't look at at once and think he's really quick, but who can really you know hurry the batters up. He bowled well at the death. I felt the way he bowled to Mahesh Tikshana and and the tail enders ensured that Sri Lanka didn't get those extra ten to fifteen runs, which would have which could have made a difference in the end, because I think the last three wickets went for one run or something. Mm. Um, so that was really promising for them. I think. This Bangladesh side, it's although they haven't performed well, there are certainly points of promise. Like you would look at look at and think, you know, in four years, if if the fifty over World Cup is still relevant, uh, you you could really have some star players in that eleven. Um, just going back to Sri Lankan cricket and the sort of the other theme of the questions we had was on the Sri Lankan cricket board themselves. I mean you were saying this is a developing situation and we're kind of learning new stuff all the time. But if I'm understanding it right, they've all been sacked. Is that is, is, is that correct? Or I, is that an oversimplification of what's going on? The sports minister has basically suspended the board temporarily okay. and appointed like a interim committee headed by Arjuna Ranatunga. So according to the uh, letter he sent, this is not to do only with the World Cup performance. But there were some issues concerning last year's T20 World Cup and finances and, you know, um, it took a legal turn, right? Um, so according to him, that is one of the reasons for appointing this interim committee to look into everything that's going on, the mismanagement of funds, um, all of that. But there's also been a cabinet subcommittee appointed by the president of the country um, <laughs> to look into this suspension by the sports minister okay. and you know to to kind of overlook things I suppose um, so like I said I mean this happened this evening so we don't know what will happen in the coming days Arjuna Ranatunga and his his committee I think were at SLC today um, it'll be interesting actually to see what happens I think that the timing could have waited until the tournament was done but uh, yeah, it'll be interesting couple of weeks and let's see how it goes. Yeah, crazy that that happens while Sri Lanka still have a theoretical chance at the semi-finals. <laughs> you wonder what happens to the interim committee if they actually do somehow squeak through. But I guess uh, good, good good for that that it hasn't. And it's also funny that, I don't know, cricket's supposed to be a support where political interference isn't allowed in the running of cricket in the country. And we've got political interference in the political interference at the moment in Sri Lanka <laughs> um but yeah that that's that, that, that's good to know and good, good to know you're as a uh, not 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 quite as confused as I am but that it's uh not not as simple as uh as I worried it might be when I was struggling to make sense of it um looking ahead to tomorrow Australia play Afghanistan if Afghanistan were to win that it would set the semi-final race up beautifully uh the big sort of bit of team news is that Steve Smith is a bit of a doubt uh, suffering with about a vertigo which he was talking about in the press conference so he had a net but it didn't sound like he was shaping up great in there but maybe he'll wake up tomorrow feeling uh, uh feeling fine cricket australia have confirmed that the game will go ahead i had a chat with uh cameron ponsonby about the background of australia's previous boycott boycott of afghanistan this year that was on last friday's podcast after the afghanistan netherlands game so i think if you want more info that's a place to go um, but yeah, should should be an interesting game and uh, uh, and one that yeah, as I say, could could set up the semi final race beautifully. And if not, I guess adds a bit more spice into that Champions Trophy race, which Bangladesh have really inserted themselves into, I suppose, because England might have thought if we beat Netherlands, we'll be on four points, we'll get our net run right above theirs, and that should be enough to see us above them and above Bangladesh. Now Bangladesh have got a decent net run rate on four points, Sri Lanka best in the moment in England on four points. It's all shaping up that, that if one of those teams can nick a game or two in the last uh, in the last round or last couple, then uh, yeah, could 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 go to anyone. Um, but anyway, that's all we've got time for today. Please do join us tomorrow for a bumper weekly show with Yaz back in the hosting chair. Cheers.